This is Matt Hurt at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. And this is episode 300 of ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. Hello and welcome to The Obsessive Viewer. We're a movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show each episode. You can find more of our work at ObsessiveViewer.com. You can also like us on Facebook and join the Facebook group at Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer. And finally, you can support us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash Obsessive Viewer at the minimum rate of $1 per month for an exclusive RSS feed with content recorded specifically for Patreon supporters. You can also uh, pledge $5 or more uh, to get access to video reaction videos uh, that we record of movies that we watch. So I'm your host, Matt Hurt, flying solo today for the 300th episode of The Obsessive Viewer to give you a breakdown of some of the stuff available on Disney+, Plus, which, if I release this in time, will be launching tomorrow. Um, I'm recording this uh, Sunday night, and uh, yeah, Disney+, Plus is launching on Tuesday, so hopefully I will get this released on Monday so you guys have a nice preview of Disney+. Plus. Um, so yeah, so what I'm going to do is basically I was given access to some screeners for Disney Plus. Um, the big one was Lady and the Tramp, the live action remake, uh, live action, CGI, whatever you want to say. Uh, well, it was live action. It was live action. Um, <laughs> uh, 100% live action. Um, anyway, the live action, uh, remake of Lady and the Tramp, which that will be kind of the featured review of this episode. And then I'm going to kind of break down some of the other things that are going to be made available on Disney Plus in the next 24 hours if you're listening to this when, uh, it's released. Um, obviously Disney Plus is gonna be, hopefully it's gonna be huge because they have so much stuff, um, that it's kind of overwhelming. Um, to be honest, <laughs> it's a little bit overwhelming and it's just, it's kind of exciting. Um, this is, we're living in an age where there is a lot, there are a lot of different options for streaming services. Obviously it's been kind of a big point of contention around the internet for people who like to complain about things, um, that, Oh, there's too many streaming services and everything, which, you know, fine, whatever that's, I'm growing to, <laughs> I'm, I'm growing to the, I'm getting to the point where that is kind of a, I mean, I, I guess that's a reasonable, um, a reasonable complaint, I guess, but it's also just like, no one is forcing you to have, like I've said this countless times, no one is forcing you to have all of these streaming services. If you want to miss out on things, whatever. Or if you're upset that you want to, that you're missing out on things, fine. That's, that's life. There's too much content out there for you to reasonably consume every piece of media. If anything, the whole fact that there are several different types of streaming services out there, uh, hopefully that will create a competitive nature out of the streaming services, the people who run the streaming services to create quality content. But I digress. Um, so Disney Plus, I feel, is going to be coming out of the gate, hopefully very strong. They tweeted out this insane list of all of the things that's going to be avail that all of the things that are going to be available for launch at launch on November 12th, um, on the service. And it's insane. Like the, someone on Letterboxd created a list of just the movies that are going to be available at launch. And it's like 500 movies. Um, it's just, it's insane. It's insane. The amount of stuff there. So th that's why I'm probably most excited about Disney plus in general, because it's just the amount of content and the amount of classic content as well. Like they will have so many, uh, movies in uh, movies <laughs> that I have never watched, like, like the original Bambi or like, like gap movies in my history that I want to fill. So as such on Letterboxd, which you can follow me at obsessive viewer on Letterboxd, um, I am creating a, I'm keeping a list of all of the movies that I am watching on Disney plus from launch to next year. So in its first year, I'm going to kind of track all the movies I watch because I really want to dive in and fill those gaps and everything. So 
Um, yeah, so my featured review will be Lady and the Tramp, and then I'll break down some of the other things. Um, I was given access to screeners for a variety of things. Um, no, The Mandalorian was not made available. Um, so that's, you know, it's whatever. But uh, there's Encore, the documentary series produced by Kristen Bell. Uh, Forky Asks a Question. Uh, High School Musical, the musical, the series. Marvel's Hero Project, the Imagineering Story. Uh, spark shorts and the world according to Jeff Goldblum. So I'm going to kind of break those down um, throughout this episode. And uh, just to point out, um, <laughs> obviously it's just me on on this episode, and it's kind of I don't know, it's kind of weird to just have me just on the on the episode for such a monumental episode. Like this is a this is a um, milestone episode. It's episode 300, which will hopefully at some point in the future, celebrate properly. But uh, I do want to just mention that uh, it's 300 episodes, and that's insane. Uh, 300 episodes of Obsessive Viewer, uh, closing in on 100 episodes of Anthology, I think, and about 35 episodes of Tower Junkies. It's just, it's insane just how much has happened and how much, how many things uh, we have released over the course of the last six and a half years. Um, so on that note, just thank you for so much for listening. If you're a new listener or old listener or what have you, if you've listened for a long time, just I really appreciate you guys um, downloading and listening to uh, the stuff we do. It's very um, uh, terrifying. Um, <laughs> It's not. I'm. I'm pretty confident with this stuff. Anyway, um, uh, before I get started, I do want to mention a few things. Though one is that uh, uh, Tiny and I will be reviewing Doctor Sleep on Tower Junkies. I may try to get Fekus on or someone on to review it on Obsessive Viewer with me. Um, maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure. But uh, but. I do want to mention that I did write a review um, as a guest post on uh, hypable.com. Uh, my friend Karen Route, who uh, I just pronounced it, or I just realized I don't know how to pronounce her name in real life. Anyway, um, she, her last name. Anyway, she recommended me to uh, recommended me for uh, writing a guest review of Doctor Sleep for hypable.com, and I did, and it went well, and I'm so super excited about it. So I'll put a link in the show notes and everything. Check that out, and then check out Tower Junkies in about a few months, or not a few months, well, maybe a few months, who knows, but no, a few weeks, we'll have a review of of uh, Doctor Sleep. So, uh, yeah, that's all the pre-show stuff I have to do, so, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started into episode 300, uh, the Disney Plus preview episode. Yes. You're like the center of your people's universe, right? Indeed. Well, I've got no leashes or fences. With me, every day could be an adventure. So, as I said, the featured review on this episode is going to be of Lady and the Tramp, and I'm going to go ahead and dive into it, essentially. So it's releasing November 12th on Disney+. Plus. Um, the synopsis is, In this heartwarming romantic adventure, a timeless retelling of the 1955 animated classic Lady, an overachieving, pampered American cocker spaniel house dog, and Tramp, a tough but lovable, fast-talking stray, embark on an unexpected adventure and, despite their differences, grow closer and come to understand the value of home uh the director of this is charlie bean and writers are andrew bujalski and carrie grenlund um it stars the vocal talents of tessa thompson and oh um (laughs) justin thoreau there you go okay so i'm not going to be spoiling anything um I'm not I'm not going to do any spoilers or anything since it's technically this is releasing before the actual service launches even if it's just a full a few hours before. So I'm not going to spoil anything so don't worry about checking timestamps or anything. Um so yeah, so let me go ahead and go into my non-spoiler thoughts on Lady and the Tramp. Um I do want to mention first that I have actually never seen the original 1955 animated classic. Um that's one of the gap movies that I'm going to be filling once uh Disney Plus launches tomorrow. Um 
So I don't have that context for this review, which is probably, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I did end up enjoying this live action remake of Lady and the Tramp. I thought it was really pretty charming. Um, like it elicits this distinct, like feel good nostalgia that I think the Disney brand is kind of all about. And I do want to mention that the kind of talking dog effects were much better than I expected. Like I really thought that it was going to be awkward and everything, but I don't know why I felt that way because I mean, I grew up loving like Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey, and I haven't revisited that or anything, but um, actually, now that I think, well, no, I think they did. Yeah, they did talk. But anyway, I mean, talking animals have been in film and TV for a long time. I mean, I mean, Mr. Ed, for God's sakes. Anyway, the effects for Lady and the Tramp are very good and the dogs work really well together. <laughs> um, in a, in a weird way. That's a weird sentence. Uh, but no, the dog acting is really good. There is, there, there are some supporting, uh, supporting characters. Most notably is Sam Elliott voicing a bloodhound who's kind of a, I mean, it's kind of a caricature of kind of the Sam Elliott brand. He's like this kind of hunter guy and he's just kind of gruff and I, I, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Um, it's kind of just expected though, but Justin Thoreau and Tessa Thompson, their voice acting was incredibly charming to me. And I thought it was, it was really kind of cute. It, it was a cute, um, movie. And I will say that the iconic, um, and classic, uh, spaghetti scene is there obviously in this remake. I mean, they would be crazy not to include it, but I think that it was pretty good. It was, it was done pretty, uh, pretty well. It was cute. So, um, a big part of this movie is how like both of the dogs are pretty different from each other. Um, lady is a very pampered, um, dog um and tramp uh the tramp is you know he's he's kind of a gruff outsider he's he's kind of a loner he has this line where um i can't remember exactly what it was but someone someone uh tells him that he's alone and he says you're uh, you say uh, ah. he says alone you must mean free and kind of his whole thing is that he, he feels that his his um his I guess social outcast, uh, ness is, uh, his loner, his loner attitude toward everything is just a, a sure sign of that he's actually free and he's able to go anywhere and do anything he wants. Um, and it's, it's fine. Um, that's, it's kind of a, I don't know. It's, it's like their dynamic is, is cute and charming and everything, but the kind of, I don't even know if I would call them star-crossed lovers, but like the kind of uh, opposites attract kind of thing. It's kind of just a tired kind of concept, and I don't know. But um, but the actual visual effects of of the dogs like interacting with each other and the uh, um, just the them talking to each other is very seamless. I I really uh, I really dug it. Like the like the idea of animals talking in movies is inherently a goofy idea, but this depiction of it just obviously fits with that Disney aesthetic. Like Disney is all about that feel good, nostalgia kind of thing and charming and family friendly kind of thing, uh, kind of, kind of tone. And I feel like that it, this movie does, does that justice quite a bit. Um, so a lot of the kind of drama surrounding this movie is that, uh, ladies owners are a, a happily married couple who are expecting a baby and lady doesn't realize. (laughs) So, so let me back up. The tramp tells lady that he, that, that, you know, the baby is going to kind of take over their life and she's not going to be able, she's not going to be the, uh, she's not going to have the same life that she had before and that she's had before. Like she's, her life is going to change and she's going to be ignored. And the tramp is coming from a kind of a, a cynical viewpoint. It's, I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's a pretty rote kind of, um, kind of plot line and everything. And maybe it's because it's a remake of a 1955 animated movie, but I mean, it's, it's the standard kind of storyline that you would expect from this, from this thing. And not necessarily that it's bad. It's just, it's just, it's kind of expected. Like, you know what to expect from this movie. So, um, the idea, like, like there's, there's stretches of the movie where Lady is, 
like she doesn't understand that a baby is coming. Um, like she, she, that's just not something that she understands or comprehends. And that's, that's a good source of comedy. I thought it was very charming in, in general. Um, there is a dog catcher in this movie that is kind of the villain, uh, the villain of the movie. And I, I don't know. It's just kind of over the top a little bit. Like, I mean, I think that's the intention that he's kind of just this over the top villain thing. It's a very cartoony Disney villain depiction, but I just feel like it's, it just didn't fit right. Even with, even with the context of the movie being a Disney movie and, and having, having that Disney sheen to it, I still think that that, uh, that character was a little bit too much and over the top. Like we have no context for why he's, so hell bent on catching tramp and we don't have any context for what makes him want to uh clean the streets of stray dogs like it's just it's just strictly like he's just a villain that just has no real outward purpose or anything like that um and i, I don't know it's just that, that that's one aspect of the movie that didn't really work for me um i do have in my notes that um so so lady a big part of the movie is obviously lady and the tramp going on kind of their like little date uh, around the city and it's very charming it's sweet it's very cute um i will like in my notes i mentioned that like lady being away from her family and everything and away from home uh makes it a dog out of yard story instead of fish out of water um please don't unsubscribe um so uh yeah so i don't know like it was it was a cute movie it was it was a very cute movie um there is an extended sequence that's like uh, that's like a, like a musical sequence. I think that those were pretty common in the original movie. Um, I'll talk more about those in a second, but there is one involving cats that, um, my understanding is that the original movie, uh, the, this sequence in the original movie from 1955 is kind of racist. Um, fortunately it's not racist here, but I will say that the, I guess the CGI, of the cats, like the cats are running, or cats are running around the house wreaking havoc and everything and singing. Um, that's where it looks kind of not too great. Like in juxtapose that with the rest of the movie, like that the visual effects of the cats just looks, it doesn't look as clear as, as you know, the live action of the movie. It's very, it very much sticks out. And that's something that I didn't really like, especially being a cat owner myself and a cat person. <laughs> um, but yeah, I will say also that throughout the movie there is, there, or there are, I don't know why I keep saying there is when I w- want to say there are, but anyway, there are a bunch of, or a handful of musical numbers, um, or maybe one or two even, I can't really remember, but I kind of feel like those were kind of too few and far between. Like if the movie wanted to be more musical, more musically focused, like have more musical numbers in it. Um, but it just felt like throughout the rest of, throughout the whole movie, not having the original and, and, uh, as a context for me, it just kind of took me, I wouldn't say took me out of it, but it kind of surprised me whenever there was a song that was performed in the movie because it, uh, kind of felt almost out of place because it felt like the movie wasn't supposed to have those. Um, or I wasn't expecting them to have them because I thought that it was just going to be a straightforward live action movie. Um, but yeah, so I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a sweet movie. I gave it three out of five stars. Um, the characterization of Lady and, and the Tramp, <laughs> the titular characters, uh, was, was pretty good. Pretty solid, actually. Um, Lady's a very impressionable character. And that works both to the movie's advantage and disadvantage because, I don't know, just the way that I feel like the kind of, the dramatic turn for her character where she kind of becomes, uh, disillusioned with her home life. I will, I'll say that much, um, kind of didn't feel as quite as earned as, as it probably should have been because the character is so impressionable. So it kind of takes just a small nudge to convince her that, uh, that her life has been turned upside down. Um, when I feel like there should have been a little bit more, um, a little bit more there and everything. Um, this is a launch movie for Disney plus, And I will say that it looks, like I said, it looks beautiful. Like uh, uh, throughout this whole episode, you'll kind of 
I'll, I'll probably be remarking <laughs> remarking about that uh, throughout the whole episode because I mean ob- obviously they have sunk a ton of money into Disney Plus and the original programming that they're going to have at launch. Like these, the the screeners that I had access to looked just very pristine and and good. Um, so I guess that's kind of a brief featured review of Lady and the Tramp. Um, I will be checking out the original, uh, come Tuesday, probably, or this week, I don't know. Um, assuming that Disney Plus launches without any hiccups or anything, which it may, um, it may be kind of expected, honestly. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens. Okay, everybody, let's take it from the top. Something's happening. Something extraordinary. Something exciting. Something authentic and true. Everything changes now. And snap. What's next? The future. That's our specialty. So the rest of this episode, I kind of want to just break down the other things that I watched, uh, courtesy of screeners for for Disney Plus in in general. So uh, the first thing that I want to bring up is Encore, um, with an exclamation point at the end. Um, So yeah, so let's just dive right in. So the plot synopsis, or the synopsis for Encore, is executive producer Kristen Bell brings together former castmates of a high school musical, tasking them with recreating their original performance in high school... in high school reunion like no other um created by jason cohen and executive produced by several people um including kristen bell so this is a really cool concept for a documentary series um on disney plus i i really dig it as a concept um I got access to two episodes. I believe the first one's going to be launching uh, on Tuesday, and then I think the second episode may actually go live on Friday, the fifteenth. Um, it's a good, it's a good pair of episodes, honestly, for the first week of Disney Plus. So the first episode covers a nineteen ninety seven production of Annie, and basically the way it's set up, as I said in the synopsis, is that um, the cast of a uh, the cast of a, of a musical are brought together, uh, after, you know, time has passed. So it's like a reunion for cast of a musical. And then they put on a, um, they redo the musical essentially. So it's a very cool concept. And it's very interesting because people who do musical theater in high school don't necessarily go on to continue doing musical theater. So you get a lot of cool interactions with people kind of catching up. Like this first episode, like I said, it's a 1997 production of Annie, so it's been 20 years. So a lot of the interactions among the cast is just them catching up with each other. So there's there's like an absence of real drama among them. And it's really, honestly, it's pretty charming and... I don't know. I wouldn't say uplifting, but it's just... It's very charming and it's, it's, uh, it's a good way to kind of showcase the reality series format essentially it's a good showcase for that format which i'm on record as not really being a fan of in general but i really enjoy the concept at least for this so since it's been 20 years like i said there's a lot of interactions where they're just catching up with each other and you kind of get this sense of like these people have haven't seen each other in 20 years and since it's been two decades there's not really a lot of like unresolved issues or anything or drama between them it's just them talking about their lives to each other and kind of just genuinely enjoying each other's company for the small amount of time that they have uh each episode um by the way it is each episode so like the first episode is a 1997 production of annie and then the next episode is a completely different one it's not like a season-long arc or anything so um, each episode, the cast is reunited and given five days to put together a performance of the show that they did in high school. Um, and the one for Annie was particularly interesting. Like, I wouldn't even say, honestly, it wasn't that interesting. <laughs> um, like this, as much as I like the concept of the episode, there wasn't enough there to really hook me. Um, that much. And honestly, I really thought just judging from the synopsis, I thought that Kristen Bell was going to be like 
a guiding force for for the series. I thought that it was going to be like Kristen Bell reunites cast members from a high school musical to bring them back together for an encore performance um, in the present day. Like I thought that that was going to be it, but that's not the case at all. Like Kristen Bell is just executive producing and introducing each episode. Um, so it's it's not she's not a figure of of the uh, of the series in terms of on screen presence and guiding it. But that's. And that's fine. It took me, I was very, I was disappointed, honestly, when I, when I realized that when I saw this first episode, but what we get instead is like, they bring in people that are, um, like in the second episode, there's a, um, someone from Broadway is brought in, I think, uh, or someone who played, uh, uh, the, uh, character in the production of the second episode, um, is brought in to kind of guide them. Um, so they bring in like, like heavy hitters to kind of guide them throughout the process. Um, this first episode of, uh, doing a reunion of Annie is just okay. Um, there's not enough drama. There's not, there's not even like, it's like they didn't, they avoided even showing them really rehearsing and everything and, and getting into the, getting into the groove of redoing this, this production. It was more just about them catching up and everything, which is charming. It's fine, but there just was a distinct lack of, of a hook to bring us into it. Um, that was the first episode. The second episode is for a 2007 production of beauty and the beast. And so since only 10 years have passed, between the original performance and this encore performance, um, I feel like there was a lot more drama there to mine. And there was like, you got the sense that there is this unresolved tension among, among some of the castmates. Um, and overall it's, I mean, it's pretty light. Like, it's not like, it's not like, Oh, they had a secret affair. Well, it's not, it's not like, the, it's not anything too dramatic, but, there is this unresolved thing like like a secret comes out about two castmates um <laughs> that is pretty charming since they're so um since there's so much distance between like since it's been a decade and everything it's more like a more like oh my god i can't believe that kind of thing instead of like oh my god i can't believe that kind of thing um really hard hitting um <laughs> review there i'm sure but anyway um it was pretty light and everything but that second episode is really where the show kind of kicked into gear for me because they actually do show the re- rehearsal process they show the hardships of it and there are it, there is at least one character that is or one one person from the cast who is um as one of the stage managers or production assistants or whatever for the for the performance said is is really a character and it's really pretty good because she has this I don't want to say larger than life personality, but maybe that's accurate. But she is, she talks about how she was uh, a little bit resentful that she didn't get the lead role when they performed Beauty and the Beast in, in high school. And instead she got, um, the, uh, the role of Miss Potts and she got that role again, like, cause it's an encore performance and everything. So a, a good bit of, dramatic flair in this second episode is that she is kind of learning how to accept her role in in the play and or in the musical and kind of kind of accept who she is now and everything it's it's really pretty interesting um they do some they show some really good like exercises like they do this whole thing where they kind of talk to their teenage selves and they asks they ask a question to their teenage self and um or their their te- they as their teenage self they ask their present day self a question it, it's very heartwarming and very personal and very um raw emotional and everything and i i really appreciated that there is also this really interesting um i want to say side or subplot or whatever but uh, of the reunion um they do bring in like a teacher that they had and like, there's a really touching, like heartwarming um, connection that one of the members of the cast has with that teacher because he has just a, like he was his mentor um, and like, they haven't seen each other in 10 years. And it's just, it's very, just um, very um, charming and, and heartwarming to see them reconnect and everything. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean that's encore. I saw those two episodes. I'll probably watch the whole season um as it comes out because I like I said it's a really good concept for a show and it uh, I really think that it found its stride with that second episode. So if you watch that first episode um and aren't too engaged by it, I would say definitely check out episode 2 because that's that's where the episode real or that's where the series really kind of kicked into gear for me. So hopefully um the rest of the season is good too. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is Forky Asks a Question. Um, synopsis uh, is Forky from Disney and Pixar's Toy Story 4 is a craft project created from trash. So he has important questions about how the world works, such as what is love? What is time? And of course, the deepest question of all, what is cheese? He explores all of these questions and more in a series of 10 shorts called Forky Asks a Question exclusively on Disney+. Plus. So these are incredibly short uh, segments. Like it's about just shy of three minutes a piece. Um, I got access to two of them. Uh, the first one is what is money? And the second one is what is a friend? And it's very, it's very cute and charming. Um, Toy Story 4 as unaffected as I, as I was by it. Um, there's no denying that Forky is the standout character of that movie. And he is, you know, he's what has hit the kind of zeitgeist of, of people who who love it the pop culture impact of forky is undeniable and as such these are very cute in short segments um i kind of think back to when mike was on the podcast and he was talking about how he took his son oscar to his first movie in the theater and it was toy story 4 and he recounted that whole experience and then he said that uh he said that uh that oscar was really into forky and and so after after the movie they went and got dinner and then they he kind of played with a spork and that really enter entertained um oscar and like i kept that in mind as i was watching these little little brief interstitial shorts because I mean, this is perfect for kids. I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect. It's short and it's like visually it looks good. Um, and the content is pretty good. Like there were a couple of bits where I actually laughed pretty, pretty, uh, pretty hard at it, especially in the, what is a friend thing. Um, so the, f the first one, what is money? He brings in ham, uh, played by John Ratzenberger. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, he, and they kind of explained what money is. And then in the second, uh, the second segment, uh, what is a friend? I won't reveal what the friend is or who the friend is that he brings on, but I was just really kind of charmed by it. I thought it was very cute. So yeah, so that's Forky Ask a Question. Little, th uh, three minutes or less, uh, short segments that are pretty entertaining in their own right. Okay, so my next thing is, the next thing I'm going to be talking about is, shockingly, um, honestly, my favorite thing of, of all of the screeners and everything that I got for Disney+. Plus. Um, and this is going to be so surprising and so <laughs> weird to say, but it's High School Musical, the musical, the series. Um... So, okay, let me just get into this. So the synopsis is from creator and executive producer Ten Federal, uh, federally, I think, um, <laughs> high school musical, the musical, the series follows the East High Drama Club as they work their way to opening night of their school's first ever production of high school musical. Showmances blossom, old friendships are tested, while new ones are made. Rivalries flare and lives are changed forever as these students discover the transformative power that only high school theater can provide. So, right off the bat, I was honestly disappointed that this wasn't a documentary. I was under the impression that it was going to be a documentary series about a high school putting together a production of High School Musical. But um, that disappointment washed away immediately. Um, and mostly because Encore kind of covers that Disney Plus theater doc uh, bit on the Venn diagram, I guess. But... I was so like surprised at how charming and entertaining this was. Like I am not the, I'm a 33 year old man who my experience with theater is seeing Kirsten in a bunch of shows. Like that's it. Um, and I just, <laughs> I was so surprised at how entertaining this was because like, like I said, I'm not the demographic. I'm not the age for this, for this show. It's like a teen drama comedy sort of. 
but it's so charming and so entertaining. Like this, it's, it has this goofy kind of tongue in cheek, uh, way about it with a level of drama that isn't melodramatic and, and it doesn't over, overshadow the comedy. So, the premise is that the high school that they're that these characters like go to is the high school where they shot the f- or uh, either shot or set the film High School Musical, and so there's this new drama teacher who's brought in who is <laughs> who is uh, adamant to make High School Musical the musical as their production that school year and there are characters like like the kind of main characters is this couple like i can't remember their names but um like they had a falling out or they broke up at the at the beginning of summer and then this is the new school year and like the guy is trying to win her back and she's with a new guy um and so they all go out for auditions and everything and it's it's man it's so like surprising how good this is like i mean i was very i was very taken with it um there is i do want to like kind of as a um as an example of kind of the the tone of the show and the and the amount of comedy in it is that the new uh theater drama de- uh, drama teacher that's brought in at the kind of school assembly that they have for the beginning of the year, she gets the microphone and she says like, this is, I wrote down this quote. I was so, I was, I don't know. I, I cackled at it. So she says, when I heard that the high school where high school musical was shot had never staged a production of high school musical, the musical, I was shocked as an actress, inspired as a director and triggered as a millennial. (laughs) And like, that's kind of, that encompasses kind of the tone of the show overall. Like it's, um, it's this cheeky, fun, um, kind of, kind of melodramatic, but comedic kind of thing. And there's this kind of light mockumentary feel to it. That's, that's a little bit, it's not as, it's not as deeply, um, mockumentary style as like the office, but it's kind of, it kind of remin, it's kind of reminiscent of, uh, of uh of um uh of a Christopher Guest movie but with more like scripted stuff like there there's just talking heads um but the rest of it is like scripted and not shot uh documentary style although the kind of camera techniques uh have like this uh kind of handheld kind of kind of uh, not, I don't want to say voyeuristic, but this handheld kind of quality to him, which I thought fit the tone of the show really well. Um, so yeah, so I got access to two episodes. The first one is the auditions. And then the second one is the read through. And honestly, I am super excited to watch this show. <laughs> it's so, I, like, I don't know. I, it's, I don't know. I just really don't know. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. I do want to, I do want to share this really funny, um, line from the second episode um that a character decides or a character is having a moment and he says i'm sorry i can't dance like fred rogers and then the uh stage manager says it's fred astaire fred rogers is mr rogers he never danced he potty trained puppets and just i don't know just that I, like those are two lines two lines from the show that just really like hit home with me and i, I really got a huge kick out of it um there are obviously musical segments and um like it's it's not like performed live or anything um it's obviously like kind of a uh, production wise it's kind of a uh separate kind of audio track that they kind of uh, I don't want to say lip sync but they kind of dub over the the scenes and everything which it's fine it's not distracting it's it's actually good like singing and everything it's very charming um and quality musical stuff i i kind of liken it to what i assume glee was like um but i never really watched glee so i don't know but um but yeah high school musical the musical the show the series really good (laughs) um i uh i'm looking forward to it also another bit about that is that the um the drama teacher what, like she was brought in and she's like a background actress for the original movie and she keeps like there are several moments throughout the first two episodes where she refers to high school musical as a classic film and like i, I don't know i just liked it i i really i really enjoyed that um yeah so i don't know high school musical the musical the series watch it it's really it's really surprisingly good um 
yeah, uh, whatever. <laughs> so that's, that's High School Musical, the musical, the series. Um, next up is Marvel's Hero Project, and the synopsis is as follows. Marvel's Hero Project reveals the remarkable positive change 20 young real-life heroes are making in their own communities. These inspiring, driven, and engaging kids have de- dedicated their lives to selfless acts of bravery and kindness, and now Marvel celebrates them by welcoming them into Marvel's Hero Project. So first off, this is a great concept for a documentary series. Now, I was given access to three episodes, but I wanted to get this episode recorded as quickly as I could, and honestly, I only had time to really watch one episode of it. But that one episode was really just incredible. Um, very uplifting. It Honestly, it made me cry a little bit. Um, so it follows this young girl who is, uh, she was born, um, without, uh, with like her, uh, I think it's her left arm, um, is kind of like, she was born without a hand essentially. And it's kind of halfway up her forearm that it's, it's kind of, it stops. And so the documentary should like, this is a documentary series, obviously each episode has, um, has a separate like tells a story of another uh, of each each episode is dedicated to a certain kid and the kind of strides they're making in their community and everything so jordan is the subject of the first episode and so she uh is handicapped and it's just it's really i mean it's really touching so it's about 24 minutes these are these are like half hour episodes and it kind of chronicles her like, t- like tells her story about it. And she's, I mean, she's a very kind of a precocious and very, um, lively kid. And it talks about how she has gotten into design, like design programs. And she's, she's like, that's her passion is to design things. And it talks about how she, uh, created this, uh, this attachment for her limb that kind of, uh, explodes glitter essentially. Um, and it's just, it's very uplifting. Like I said, it's, it's really, uh, like it's very heartfelt and kind of the frame of the, of the, of the series and of the show is that, uh, Marvel is creating these like, like kind of collector's edition, uh, like personalized comic books to, uh, called the hero project. And so, you see like the kind of design that they use and everything. And it's just, it's great to see like, like Jordan's reaction is so uh like what is what kind of tear, make me tear up a bit. And also just the kind of the comic book feel of the, of the series. Like they show a lot of um kind of like the, the establishing shots of certain things. It's like, it has the kind of standard, like comic book, like established, like uh speech, bu- not speech bubble, but like kind of the square kind of establishing thing. Um, you can tell I don't read comics, but, um, or not as much. I don't know. But anyway, there's a very comic book aesthetic to the show that I really appreciated. And it's very well done in terms of production and everything. And it's just a very heartfelt show. Um, I was given access, like I said, to three episodes. I only got to see one. Um, really excited to watch the other two and follow this show because it's it seems very um uplifting and and affirming and just inspiring honestly um because the like the amount of work that jordan in this first episode did it's like clear that she's passionate about design and everything and she's like it's it's interesting to see like it's it's always interested me to see people do what they love and everything. And it's just, it's really affirming. I, I really liked uh, Marvel's Hero Project. So, yeah. So, next up is the Imagineering Story. So, the Imagineering Story is a documentary series. And I'll go ahead and read the synopsis now. Creating happiness is hard work. This six-hour saga chronicles the 67-year history of Walt Disney Imagineering, a place best described as equal parts artist studio, design center, think tank, and innovation laboratory. This is where an eclectic group of creative people bring ideas to life. They're responsible for building 12 theme parks around the world, the happiest places on Earth. Directed by Academy Award-nominated filmmaker Leslie Iwerks uh, and narrated by Angela Bassett. So this is very much, it's a straightforward documentary. Um, I'm really appreciative that they are 
it's it's a documentary series that's in six segments. So I got access to the first two episodes of this. Both are an hour and change. And man, does this make me want to go to Disney World <laughs> and Disneyland for that matter. Um, I've been to Disney World once when I was like, I don't know, five or six. I can't really remember anything about it. But just the amount of um, detail that's given to the to to this story is incredible. Like, the first episode is kind of all about Walt Disney creating Disneyland. And then episode two is uh, kind of about the rise of Disney World and Epcot and Space Mountain and, and kind of just theme parks all around the world. <laughs> um, or not really around the world. Like it kind of ends with a look at Tokyo. Uh, but it's just... I really, really liked this. Um, very engaging documentary. It's filled with tons of high def archival footage and photographs, um, old interviews with Walt Disney and a bunch of Imagineers, also, uh, present day interviews with them. Not, well, not with Walt Disney, but you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and it's just, it's, tons of stuff. Like it is kind of an all access kind of thing. And like I said, it makes me want to visit these theme parks so badly. Um, and it's also funny because it really like makes me realize how much, um, (laughs) Iron Man two kind of, uh, played up the whole kind of Walt Disney thing of, uh, of Tony Stark's dad. Anyway, um, that's a digression. So, um, yeah, the, vi- and I want to say that this is a, this has really good narration by Angela Bassett, a uh, very engaging, very, uh, interesting subject matter and everything. Like I remember when I was a kid, like my mom was obsessed with all things Disney and we had like VHS tapes of all the Disney animated movies, a lot of which I don't remember seeing or haven't watched. So that's why I'm looking forward to kind of doing, uh, kind of filling those gaps when Disney plus launches. But, uh, one of the distinct memories I have is that my mom would always like, she dreamed of going to Disney world. She wanted to go to Disney world maybe more than anything. Um, and so she would send like, she would, she would, um, request or have like the, if, (laughs) if any of you remember that this was a thing, like they would send promotional videos to people who requested them. And so we would get like, I feel like it was like one a year, just a video cassette that you would put plug into the plug into the VCR and watch just a breakdown of Walt Disney, like, like Disney world. And it would show all the attractions and it would show like this whole, like, like how to stay, like where to stay and everything. And like all of the resorts. And it was just so, um, like weirdly enough, like I have more memories of that than I have of actually being at Disney world. But I just remember that being like, I, it hits me right in the nostalgia that like that, that was a big part of my childhood in a weird way. Um, and I'm glad that we finally went to Disney World, but I just don't remember anything of anything about it. But I do remember those promotional videos and it's just, it's really, uh, it's really fascinating to see the level of work that went into creating these theme parks and the, like the Imagineering itself and like, my God, it makes me want to go so badly. Like I was sitting there thinking like, how, how can I afford to go to Disney world? Maybe take my mom. <laughs> but, um, I don't know if, if you guys want to donate, please do. But, uh, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. But, uh, but yeah, it would just be amazing to go back. Um, cause, cause like there's so much archival footage in this, in these, in these, uh, documentary episodes. Um, you see like the creation of the parks, you see the, like them creating, like, uh, just basically just doing the construction of everything. Um, the Matterhorn and, and of, of like the monorail system and everything. And it's just, it's really all encompassing. It's really fascinating to see just how much they got in terms of, of, uh, of all of the content that they have to show us. And the interviews are very interesting. We get a lot of interesting, uh, insight into Walt Disney's vision and his, his brother's vision for Walt Disney world. And there's just a ton of stuff. It was very, very engaging. I'm very much looking forward to the other four episodes and, uh, I can't, I can't wait to see the rest of this. It's just, like I said, it's just so all encompassing and I'm so happy that they made it, 
a six hour documentary series instead of doing like a feature length documentary and having to, um, having to cut down on so much content because this is so, uh, thrilling to me that they have all of this information that's going to be parsed out in six, uh, hours, um, as opposed to just two and a half or two. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this. There's a lot of, um, archival news footage and stuff, um, just about the news surrounding, uh, Disney World and Disneyland. Um, yeah, and God, it just makes me want to go. Um, you get some really cool, uh, really cool looks at, uh, the making of the Haunted Mansion and of It's a Small World and so much stuff that went into it. I was particularly, um, taken with the, uh, the information that I gleaned from the documentary about Space Mountain. Like, I want to go to Space Mountain, damn it. Um, but yeah, and also really fascinating background onto, uh, on the, uh, creation of Epcot, uh, in terms of the actual execution of it versus Walt Disney's original, uh, vision for it. And I just, I'm really, really fascinated by this documentary series and kind of unlike, uh, unlike Encore, uh, this is a documentary series that's like, it's very much, uh, I don't want to say it's geared toward adults or anything, but it's, it's a very, um, well crafted and, and well put together kind of documentary series. It's not something that's like, it's not, you don't see, it's not like hosted by Forky or anything. Like, it's just very, very, uh, cleanly put together and, uh, focused on the content rather than the presentation. Not to say that the presentation is bad, not by any stretch, because there is so much to this documentary series. Um, but it's just really cool to see this, this level of detail, um, for this documentary series, the Imagineering story. Okay. So next up is another reality series, um, that I probably should have talked about before because this, this is where it's going to come into play that, uh, these two documentary series are very much different in tone, but it's, uh, Jeff Goldblum, or I'm sorry, the world according to Jeff Goldblum. Now, let me read the synopsis real quick. This is kind of a lengthy one. This is the cosmos of the everyday. Uh, Jeff Goldblum takes us on a wild, playful, and smart ride through the most extraordinary, ordinary things, from sneakers to denim jeans, ice cream, and tattoos. Across 12 episodes, Jeff will reveal a dozen indispensable and ubiquitous icons of America that were invented, innovated, or popularized in the U.S. Pop cultural signifiers that'll let Jeff show how our most fam- our most familiar things can actually feel bigger than the Big Bang. And that's all I'll read from the synopsis. Um... I believe that this is a Nat Geo original um, series, which is owned by Disney now, like everything is. Um, and so I like I got access to, I think, three episodes of this. I only had time to watch the first one, which is about sneakers. Um, and first off, I just want to mention that <laughs> Jeff Goldblum has been in the news recently. Uh, he made a comment about Woody Allen saying that, uh, he was, that Jeff Goldblum would consider, ma- like, it was very kind of coy the way that he said it, but like, he would consider maybe working with Woody Allen again because, um, the, uh, he basically did the whole kind of burden of proof, th- or not burden of proof thing, but the innocent until proven guilty kind of thing, uh, which of course Woody Allen is has been uh, Woody Allen has been accused of of molestation by uh, by his children essentially. So Jeff Goldblum said that he would maybe consider working with him again um, because there's a innocent until proven guilty kind of thing. So aside from that, <laughs> Jeff Goldblum is a national treasure. Um, and I'm comfortable saying that because he is so entertaining. Um, that's, it, it's, it, that's a hard, uh, web to navigate there. But basically, I'm not, I'm not condoning, uh, his comments about Woody Allen. I'm not condemning him for his comments about Woody Allen. He's entitled to his opinion, as wrong as it may be in the court of public opinion and in my own heart. But Jeff Goldblum as an entertainer, as a performer and everything is still someone that I, uh, derive a lot of entertainment from and I really uh liked him in the world according to Jeff Goldblum. So let's get into the actual documentary while I dance around this uh delicate topic here. So the episode that I watched was him kind of going through and talking about sneakers. And it's very interesting. It's a about a half hour documentary series. Um 
it's really entertaining because Jeff Goldblum is so uh, energetic in a very in a very Jeff Goldblum way. Like he's very um, charismatic, and like that's that's kind of what the show is all about. It's his charisma and his entertaining nature as he's like doing his whole Jeff Goldblum, like, Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know kind of thing. Um, that's a terrible Jeff Goldblum impression, but, um, it's him doing his Jeff Goldblum thing while talking to people about this subject, uh, that he's covering in the documentary series. And it's, it's really, uh, pretty thorough too. Like sneakers, he goes to the Adidas headquarters and he does like, uh, <laughs> uh, he, he, he goes to the Adidas headquarters essentially, and he learns about kind of, uh, the, what it takes to create foot, no, create feet, Jesus, uh, to create shoes and sneakers and everything. And like the kind of the engineering that goes into the creation of, of, uh, sneakers and everything. And then it doesn't stop there either. Like he goes and he, uh, he kind of talks about the kind of the, um, uh, the kind of public, perception of sneakers and like he goes to like a, a basketball court and talks to a bunch of like pickup basketball players and they talk about the fashion side of it and um and like what it's like what sneakers mean to them and playing basketball and everything and then he also goes to a sneak like i think it's called sneaker con in cleveland ohio where like tons and tons and tons of money is poured into just sneakers like the sneaker industry like there's such a collectible kind of thing to it and so like the amount of money that's dropped on on just a single pair of shoes is really really obscene to me (laughs) um but i mean to each their own like i have my own little i think i have asics i don't know but um yeah i i don't even know i just i i anyway um it's just, it's really, it's really kind of, uh, interesting to kind of dive into it, into the culture of sneakers and everything. Um, and yeah, so, and then he interviews some interesting people and talks to some interesting people about it. Um, people who make custom sneakers and it kind of goes through, uh, it's, it's pretty thorough with, with what, what he does. It's all very cheeky and lighthearted and everything, which is why I said that it's a good, um, kind of counterbalance to the Imagineering story because the Imagineering story is very much historical and very much like straightforward. Like this is, this is the history of uh, the imagine, uh, like the Imagineers and Imagineering at Walt Disney and everything. And then here it's just like, Oh, Jeff Goldblum, Jeff, Jeff Goldblooming about sneakers or <laughs> tattoos or whatever. Um, very charming, very charismatic, very entertaining. I'm looking forward to watching more episodes of it. So, um, yeah, we're coming up to the end of episode 300 of the Obsessive Viewer podcast. I'm going to close out this episode by talking about Spark Shorts, uh, the last thing that I had on the screeners list for, uh, Disney Plus. Uh, synopsis is Spark Shorts is Pixar Animation Studios artists' projects designed to discover new storytellers and explore new short form storytelling techniques. So I got access to, I think, three or four of these short films. Um, it's basically all it is is just short films created by, uh, Pixar Animation Studios, uh, artists, uh, as projects, apparently, judging from the synopsis. Um, there's no, like, framing of it. There's no, like, they're not introduced or anything, which I think is kind of a, kind of a, a downside to it. Maybe when the actual service launches, is, launches, there will be, like, a kind of frame thing. Cause I would love to see just, like, a documentary series around this. Um, but as it is in the screeners and as it presumably will be when Google, uh, when Google plus when Disney plus launches tomorrow, um, it's just a collection of the shorts. So the one that I watch is this short film called smash and grab, uh, the kind of <laughs> rudimentary synopsis that I had for, I had for it that I wrote up is it's a charming story of friends banding together to escape bondage and share uh, and chart a better life for themselves. Um, so this is about an eight minute, uh, short film and it is very, uh, very in tune with what Pixar animation studios is kind of all about is at least in their short films. So, when you go see a Pixar movie, usually at the theater, um, it is accompanied by a short film uh, from Pixar Animation Studios. And a lot of those are just kind of silent films that 
that, you know, tells a story through the visual medium. And this is no different. Smash and grab is no different. And I was very kind of, I was impressed by it. I thought it was pretty, pretty solid. Um, basically the, uh, the, the friends of, of it are two robots that are in a train kind of shoveling like coal into it to keep it running. And, they basically, like I said, band together to escape bondage and chart a better life for themselves. And just the storytelling of it's really, uh, really pretty good. It's, it's, it's not as intricate in terms of the visual storytelling as, uh, as like some of the other Pixar shorts are, but I wouldn't dock it any points for that. Cause I mean, I followed it very well and it was very, uh, entertaining there's some very heartfelt moments in it and some drama and action and adventure um all in eight minutes and i was very uh i was pretty impressed by it the design of it um was pretty good uh there's world building that's very impressive and tell like tells a visual story um like i said um it's just the short films um i would i would really Oh, man, I, I, I really wish that they would have done like a kind of documentary series about, about these shorts, like have like eight minutes, like show it for eight minutes, but before that kind of introduce it by interviewing the filmmakers and in, interviewing the people that, that were talking about it. And then like increase it to like a 24 minute or 25 minute, uh, documentary show where the first, uh, I can't do math. The first 16 minutes or something is all about the production of it and kind of recounting the production and everything and then end it with showing the finished film. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, it's just the short films, which isn't a problem, but I just feel like there could have been kind of more to it. Um, and yeah, I kind of would have uh, liked that a bit more, but um, but it's it's fine in its own way. So yeah, that's all the screeners I had access to. Um, that's Disney plus, um, that's episode 300 of the obsessive viewer. Um, I am very much looking forward to Disney plus launching. Like I said, at the top of this episode, it is hopefully going to be a big success for them because I know Disney's hurting for money. Um, (laughs) that's not true. They are going to own us all. Um, it's actually funny when I was watching the Imagineering story, um, I kind of imagined a future where, um, the entire planet is like, if we, like, if, uh, like, uh, if aliens or like if we expanded and humanity expanded to the stars and everything, like I could see like coming back to the planet earth and being like Walt Disney's planet earth or, uh, Disney's planet earth because, they're going to own everything. Um, but if any Disney execs are listening, thank you so much for providing me with screeners. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Disney plus is launching tomorrow. I'm very much looking forward to it. Despite my kind of general, um, malaise towards star Wars, I am looking forward to the Mandalorian. Um, I think that's going to be pretty interesting. Once it launches, it'll be a big topic of conversation. Of course. Um, I'm also, like I said, just really looking forward to kind of diving into the classics. Um, like the original Lady and the Tramp, Bambi, all that, Pocahontas, like just all of the, <laughs> uh, the classic films such as High School Musical and High School Musical 2 and High School Musical 3, senior year. Um, really excited for those. <laughs> um, but s- seriously, before I end this episode, please, please watch High School Musical, the musical, the series. Like, it's, it's, it's so much better than, than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. So yeah, so that'll do it for episode 300 of the obsessive viewer podcast. Once again, guys, thank you so much for listening to us for 300 episodes. Um, if you have listened to every single episode of the podcast, thank you. Oh my God. That is, that's so kind. Um, (laughs) and when I listen back to this, I'm going to think that I'm talking to myself because I've listened to every episode because I am a narcissist. But, uh, but yeah, no, thank you guys so much for supporting us and for listening to us and for following us for six and a half years, 300 episodes. Um, can't wait to do 300 more and 300 more after that and 300 more after that until we are all dead and gone. And, uh, Disney's planet earth is just a rotting, uh, ball of, post-apocalyptic wasteland um this went weird um 
yeah so closing out the episode i can't remember what all i do but thank you guys so much for supporting us and for listening to us uh all the information is going to do for contacting us will be in the outro so uh yeah oh i should probably say what's coming up on the podcast um trying to work out logistics to get mike on to talk about horror films and our uh each of our Shocktobers, so that should be in a week or so, hopefully. Um, I do have a review of, a pretty laid-back review, it's entertaining as hell, um, review of Knives Out with Kirsten that uh, we recorded last week when we saw Knives Out uh, an, an, at an advanced screening. What I think I'm going to do is uh, release that closer to Thanksgiving because Knives Out comes out on Thanksgiving uh, or Thanksgiving weekend and I'll release that and I think I'm going to pair that with the remaining Heartland red carpet recordings that I have. So look out for that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, me and Tiny are going to have to do an extended potpourri. Um, but yeah, and before you guys know it, it's going to be the end of the year and we're going to have our year in review episode. Can't wait. Um, and I think what I'm also going to do, <laughs> this is me just mapping out the rest of the year. Um, what I'm hoping to do is do a, uh, kind of, um, clip show thing for the Patreon feed. Um, I'll have more on that next month. I'm hoping for like a Christmas day release for that. So, um, if you're on the fence about supporting us on Patreon, you'll get a nice clip show to give you an idea of what to you can, what you're missing out on essentially. <laughs> Um, at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. And then, uh, I'm hoping that the last episode of the year, I'm really hoping that we will, uh, I'll, I'll do maybe another one of these episodes where I'm just solo on, on the podcast. But, um, since I'm now a member of the Indiana Film Journalist Association, I am up to my eyeballs in four year consideration award screeners. <laughs> Um, and what I think I'm going to do is maybe end the year with just a breakdown of all the four year consideration award screeners that I've, that I've gotten and, uh, kind of give my thoughts on each one. So we'll see that's a month and a half away. Um, yeah, let us know what you think of Disney plus when it launches tomorrow and yeah, um, we'll have to reconvene and talk about high school musical, the musical, the series in more depth. Um, so uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you next time. And when I say we, I mean me and my cat, and also Tiny, and Fekus, and Kirsten, and Mike, and uh, Ben, our contributor. So yeah, so thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. A little kitty. Peace out. Well. You're keeping that in, right? Oh, definitely. Oh, all the okay. time. <laughs> My little baby. Come here, little baby. It's okay. Come here. Come here. I know. You're pretty. I know. I just imagine she's always telling me that she's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Yep. The Obsessive Viewer podcast is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to ObsessiveViewer.com slash OV archive. You can also like our Facebook page and join the OV Facebook group at Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer. And follow us on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer and at Obsessive Tiny. And follow our recurring co-hosts at I am Mike White, that's me, at R.A. Fekis and at Burger underscore Lurker. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate. Or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. For official Obsessive Viewer merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more, visit our Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at teepublic.com, T-E-E, public.com. 
For information about our annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find Anthology, Matt's solo podcast covering The Twilight Zone, and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology TV shows at anthologypod.com and on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at thesecularperspective.com. The theme music for The Obsessive Viewer comes courtesy of the band Loud Like from their EP, Mistakes We Must Make. Additional bumper music is provided courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash asgoodasitgetsband. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Kitty! When I heard that the high school where High School Musical was shot had never staged a production of High School Musical, the musical, I was shocked, inspired, and triggered as a millennial. Auditions are after school. I've seen the original movie 37 times and the first 15 minutes of both sequels. It would be insane to think I might actually have a shot at playing Gabriella. I know we're not a couple anymore. It was my idea to take a pause. I didn't want to take a pause. I can't believe it. She's dating E.J. Haswell. This is a nightmare. Okay, theater people. I want to audition for Gabriella. Ryan, right? I think he'd rather play Sharpay. That is so fresh. I'm bummed that we don't have any competition here. She has to see me in a whole new light. I'm auditioning for this thing tomorrow, and nothing is going to stop me. The cast list is posted. We have our Gabriella and our Troy. Buckle up, Wildcats. It's about to get real. I basically have zero chill about this right now. What are you doing here? If you really cared about me, you'd let somebody who wants to play this part play it. You all walked in here as strangers. But after today, you're a family. I believe in us. Excuse me. Is there somewhere you're supposed to be? Broadway.